I'm Sam Matthews. Uh, I'm a 2015 fellow at Code for America. Uh, and my background is in GIS and cartography. And now I'm a web developer. And this is my colleague, Patrick. Yeah, uh, Patrick Hammonds, um, uh, 2016 fellow with Pittsburgh. Um, right. <laughs> I'm not a 2016 fellow. It's 2015 right now. That's the year. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, my background's in cartography and GIS. I used to work as an open data GIS person at the city of Philadelphia. Um, so yeah, we need to get this actually up on the screen. Uh, <laughs> click what? On this. Oh, we're in there now? You can see that the help thing came up. Cool. Sweet. We went through 20 different slides throughout that, so you missed the first 20. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Uh, Today we're going to be talking about the basics of web mapping. Um, we are going to just give a brief overview on some different tools and some quick demos uh, to get you started web mapping as you go forth. Um, if you have a computer, you're welcome to follow along. Uh, it's going to be, like I said, a little quick. Uh, it's going to be quicker than a tutorial. Um, uh, but if you feel so inclined, please do so and go to that link, uh, bit.ly summit web mapping. That is the presentation that we are looking at right now. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then as we go through this entire presentation, uh, any dark slides like this are going to be kind of like lists of different tools that we are recommending. Uh, so all of these slides will be available afterwards, so don't feel like you need to get photos uh, or uh, remember them by heart uh, right now. But just so you are aware, that is what these slides are for. Um, so yeah. Maps are hard, but so can you. Um, today, like I said, we're going to be talking about web maps, but we're going to be uh, specifically talking about web map history. Uh, we're going to break down web maps, talk about their anatomy and the different pieces that go into making one. Uh, we're going to talk about some data, specifically some web data. Uh, and then we're going to go into some visualization tools. Um, so what is a web map? Uh, it is not a piece of paper. and We'll go with that. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, it's a map that's on your browser. Uh, it's digital. And you can look at it usually from anywhere in the world, unless you're uh, on a closed access for some reason. Uh, we're not going to be talking about uh, Earth engines, such as Google Earth, today. Uh, we'll also not be talking about mobile device mapping, uh, such as collecting data. Um, so sorry if that was your plan. Uh, so a little history. Do you guys remember MapQuest? Uh, way back when, everyone got routes from MapQuest and probably got pretty lost. Uh, so did we. Uh, MapQuest actually gave us some really good stepping stones for uh, mapping, uh, for visualizing our world uh, pretty remotely. Uh, but every time you had to click to go to a different part of the, the world, it reloaded the page. Um, so that was a little slow and didn't allow you to explore. It was mostly like you needed to know what you were looking for in order to make it a smooth, seamless process. Uh, so after that, Google uh, came out with a pretty revolutionary concept, such as the map, or called the map tile. Uh, map tiles are uh, basically they're they're literally just little images. Uh, map tiles are 256 by 256 pixel images of the Earth. Uh, this is just an example of a bunch of different tiles, um, but they are all in the exact same space and place, unless you have a different definition of place. <laughs> but that's my geography. Uh, uh, they load a lot faster than one big map. Um, as, you get, as you click around on a map, uh, tiles are only going to load within the space that you are visualizing. Uh, they allow you to click and drag a map across a page. And as you change your geographical bounds, different tiles are going to load based on what bounds you're in. Uh, colloquially, we call these slippy maps. So tiles are like kind of crazy because there's a lot of them, depending because the world's huge. And there's a lot of different zoom levels that uh, we can visualize the Earth at. So at zoom level one, you have one tile. So that's like the entire world in one little 256 square PNG file, uh, which is pretty impressive. Uh, if you go to zoom level two, there are four. If you go to zoom level three, there are 16. And exponentially up. <laughs> Lizzie's correcting me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and if you go all the way to zoom level 19, there's some over 200 billion tiles across the entire world, which is absolutely insane. And that's a lot of computer processing power. 
uh, to render all of those. But you don't need to render them all at the same time on the browser. You're only rendering what's necessary at what zoom level you're at. So zoom is really important. Uh, what does it give you? It gives you scope. Uh, geographic scope is incredibly important for showing what's necessary and what's not necessary. At zoom level seven here on the Washington coast, you can see the coastline, you can see some mountain uh, hill shading, you can see where Forks and Nia Bay are located as points, but not as polygons here. At zoom level 10, you start to zoom in, uh, roads become a little clearer, hill shades become stronger, and you're starting to see even land use, uh, at least, yeah, you can see different, uh, different colors there showing different land uses. Zoom 12, you start to get road labels, and then at zoom 15, you start to get building outlines and park outlines. Um, so you can show a lot of different information at very different zoom levels. Uh, map tiles are loaded over HTTP or to HTTPS. Um, like this, this is just a URL here for a zoom level 13 tile at Oakland. Uh, so breaking that down uh, in the URL at the bottom there, you can see that the Z is your zoom level. Uh, X is from the left number of tiles and Y is from the top down number of tiles that you are loading. Uh, so don't feel like you need to memorize that URL because uh, we'll get to why you don't. Um, yeah, so putting all those tiles together, uh, it makes up what we call a base layer. Now, there's a lot of different types of base layers, and there's a lot of really beautiful types of base layers. There's a lot of really not beautiful types of base layers, but that's up for you to decide. Uh, there's a lot of really great companies out there that provide tiles for us because it's a really hard thing to do to make your own tiles. Uh, Esri uh, provides a great set of tiles. OpenStreetMap has a good number of tiles out there. Google has a ton of different tile sets. MapQuest now, having caught up from their former selves, is actually a great mapping service, and they are in the tile game now. Uh, and then Mapbox has also allowed us to start making our own tiles. Uh, so those are just a few providers. Cool. So um, in the anatomy of the web map, um, Sam just talked a lot about tiles. You put stuff on top of tiles, uh, those are additional layers, um, and typically that's vector data. So um, vector data is a collection of, of coordinates, um, and it's typically uh, either point, line, or polygon, and you can just layer that on top of your tiles, and you've got an, actually an interesting map. Um, so this is all tiles, this is the base map. On top of that, you can put points, um, or you can put lines, like that little route that just came up, and uh, you can put polygons. So there's typically two different kind of data sets in GIS. There's like raster and then there's, um, there's vector. That's, uh, and you mash them all together and you've got a map basically. But how do you actually data? So um, in a traditional GIS you have shape files, right? So shape files are in Esri format. Those have been a long time ago. Um, and they are a bunch of files put together um, that you can load into a GIS. Um, the internet doesn't technically really like that that much because it takes a lot to process that. Um, so the internet likes GeoJSON. Um, ArcGIS, QGIS, GDAL, MapShaper, um, they're great for making GeoJSON. Um, so we are going to do some quick uh, downloading of data and then make that into GeoJSON. I'm going to try to do this on the fly and change. We are originally going to do it in QGIS, but we're on a computer that we didn't install anything on. So I'm going to try to do it in CarDB and see if it works. Um, but you can go to, uh, yeah, bit. I'm gonna skip out of here. Um, you can go to bit.ly summit maps data. So we decided we really wanted to tempt like the live demo gods today um, by making most of this live demos. So we'll see if that works. Um, so this is, um, OpenDataJS.com, a really good source for geodata. A lot of cities have pretty complete um, pages um, where you can get all kinds of data. This is Alameda County Fire Stations. Um, you can go to download this data directly. Um, in this case, I'm going to do a shapefile. See if the download actually works. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, the download works. Okay. It's the first thing that worked. And then I'm going to try to do, there's a lot of ways to make GeoJSON. I prefer usually to use actual software. Um, in this case, we're going to try to do an external service card DB. Um, see if I can just drag it in, actually. Yay, drag. 
connect. <laughs> and it's, it's doing something. Oh, it's doing something. Oh, look, it did something. Great. <laughs> um, all right. I can export it from here. And I can do GeoJSON. Yay, live demo gods. OK. So um, now that I have that, um, we can actually go and so we just did that. Um, if you go to geojson.io, pretty cool service. Um, you can actually see what geojson looks like. I'm going to try to do this again just to see if I can. Oh my god. <laughs> so there it works. Um, this is all geojson. This is what geojson looks like. Um, it's, a, it's a JSON spec uh, that's for web mapping, basically. Um, it's a little formatted differently. You can see it has all this information. That's really cool. So these, all these properties right here are what you'd know in GIS as like fields, maybe. Um, it's just key pairs. Um, and you've got it all on a web map. Um, something cooler is you can save this as a gist. Which is? So it just is, oh no, API rate limit exceeded. <laughs> what? Wait, what? What are you saying? Just go to gist and make a new gist. OK. So a gist is a way, basically, to just store um, some information that you can kind of link to, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily um, like connected to a repo. It's just the thing you can share text. Um, so web. Mapping test dot geodeson. And I'm going to create a public gist. And it should have actually created an actual map. I think you have to sign in to edit. I have to sign in. Yeah. Rawr. All right, I'm not going to do that. because I'd have to do the last pass thing. <laughs> I'm super secure, so it makes this hard. Um, so anyway, it basically does the same thing as, what's that? As that geojson.io, you can load it into a map, you can link to it, um, and you could show, um, you could show all this data in a, in a, a gist that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> sorry, live demo gods, again. Um, so you said GeoJSON looks like this. Okay. And I will hand it over to Sam to talk a little bit more about the JavaScript kind of stuff. All right, so I'm gonna go back to Gist and I'm gonna make that work because Patrick has lots of uh, security things on his GitHub. Uh, <laughs> Two-factor authentication <laughs> gets me again. Uh. All right. Cool. There we go. Uh, <laughs> that was surprisingly fast. Uh, so I'm going to go back to that just and show, I, I think it's important to show that uh, GitHub actually renders GeoJSON as visual maps, um, which is a relatively new feature of GitHub, or at least a couple years ago. Um, GeoJSON. Oh, yeah. And create public gist. Uh, so with saving that there, uh, it's going to load and show us points. Uh, so what's really cool in your version control, uh, if you're working with GitHub, uh, you're you can you can version control geographic data, which I think is a really powerful thing to be able to do. I think you had a quick question. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Earlier you were showing the tiles. Were you doing the GeoJSON? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, GeoJSON is in lat long. If that, I'm going to go into which coordinate reference system it is in, if that's important. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'll also get back. Yeah. Um, we can show the text if you want. Um, anyways, 
So GeoJSON is a uh, store. It's more, most common to be in WGS 84. Uh, so everything that tiles are built in is Web Mercator. Uh, so it's a cylindrical projection. And uh, with WGS 84, uh, GeoJSON in lat long pairs will be able to render properly on uh, that uh, square map. Well, I guess rectangle if you have the whole thing loaded. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do next is uh, take what we have as a GeoJSON. We have new web ready data. And I'm going to put it into a web mapping library. Uh, web mapping libraries are typically written in JavaScript, uh, so hence them really liking GeoJSON since it is part of JSON spec, or is, is a JSON spec. Um, there's a lot of really great web mapping libraries out there. Um, Leaflet is probably the most popular open source version or map, web mapping library. Mapbox.js is built on top of Leaflet and gives you services that Mapbox is built. Uh, Esri Dojo is there is Esri's uh, web mapping library. Google Maps has a big API for web mapping, and Open Layers is another open source competitor out there. Uh, so those are just a few of them. Uh, there's a ton more, uh, but they all play off of each other and keep pushing each other uh, to get better. Uh, so I would open my favorite text editor here on my computer, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but we're going to use Mapbox.js just to uh, keep things smooth here. Um, and we're going to use uh, a new tool that has been introduced to us or that we'll be using right now because we're using a different computer called CodePen.io, which is not a mapping thing. It's just for showing, kind of like just uh, showing uh, rendering code on your in your browser. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show a brief amount of code. Uh, I think it's important to show the little, the few lines of uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript needed to to render a map in a browser. Uh, this isn't intended to be a like largely uh, coding heavy tutorial, um, but I think it's super powerful, or I think it's really cool how powerful some of these web mapping libraries are. Uh, you can add like single lines of code to uh, provide entirely new features. Uh, so I'm going to go do a little bit of that uh, just to make it seem a little less scary. Uh, but if you are not a coder, do not worry. Um, we will we will all make it through it. Um, so go back to gist. I just have a few of these files saved. All right, so I'm going to start with a very basic index.html file. Um, and we're going to load in uh, the, the, the Mapbox JavaScript library. Uh, so I will go through. Sorry, I should comment these out. Um, cool. All right, so I'm going to go through the four really key things in this file here. Can everyone read that? Should I make that bigger? Um, How's that? I can probably go bigger there. Yeah. Yeah? All right. <laughs> uh, cool. OK, so from the top, this is, this is one index file, one HTML file. Uh, the first very important thing on here is actually just loading in the Mapbox JavaScript library. It also comes with a CSS uh, uh, file that pairs with it, so don't forget that. Um, secondly, we are going to add a style for an HTML element that we have appropriately called map uh, with an ID of map. Uh, and we're just giving it a width and a height uh, just so it actually shows up. And then the background, so you can see the gray background is here. Um, uh, third, we actually have that HTML element called map uh, right here. And then fourth are just two lines of JavaScript uh, that are required to render a map using Mapbox.js. Um, so the first line is an access token, which you can get by just signing up for a free account on Mapbox.com. Uh, and the second line is actually initiating a map here. Uh, so if I uncomment this uh, token and save, oh, it refreshes for me. I have to save or zoom out. Uh, so I'm going to have to zoom in and out to make sure people can read and see now. <laughs> um, but it renders. Like, literally two lines of JavaScript is all that's required to put a map on the web. Um, that's incredibly powerful. I, I used Mapbox Streets, which is their tile set that we've talked about. Uh, there's a ton of different tile sets, as I said, that work with Mapbox. 
um, and like and with leaflet subsequently. Um, so you can load in quite a few different uh, things here. But like we didn't have to build the tiles. We didn't have to add these zoom buttons. We didn't have to add this sweet info thing that links us to OpenStreetMap. Uh, we just had to write a couple lines of code, and now we are ready to roll. Um, so I'm going to go a couple steps further and show you what uh, at least Mapbox has given in their library, but it's definitely available in the other uh, web mapping libraries as well. Um, so with... Okay, oh yeah, Impor more importantly, I'm gonna add the data that Patrick just made uh, to the map, uh, <laughs> which is probably what should happen first. Um, so... Take that. I'm just going to replace this here. I'll zoom in again. All right, this is like, this is a little messy with our screen width here, but uh, I'll walk through what's happening here. Uh, so we have, right now have an empty GeoJSON object that Patrick was pointing out. I will fill that with what he just gave. Uh, but this line in line 28 here uh, is going to add a GeoJSON file, which we have labeled as a variable uh, here, I can only show five lines of code on this entire screen right now, which is a little tough, uh, uh, and add it to uh, the map. So, get the, where'd we save that, Patrick? I'll just copy yeah, it from here. There. I'm just gonna paste this straight in the file. Uh, typically, you'd have, oh my gosh. <laughs> Typically, you'd have your geodata like, linked to from an external site or an external service. Um, but for the sake of simplicity, we will add it here. Um, all right, so it refreshed, but it doesn't look like we have any points. That's because our points are not over Null Island. Uh, we, they are over Oakland, or at least we hope so. Ah, ah there they are. Um, so I'm going to just sit there because with one more line of code, we can actually center the map on the bounds of all of our available data, uh, which is rather incredible, because it's a lot of things that you're computing all at the same, same moment. So if I do this handy dandy get bounds uh, feature, our map reloads wow. at the extent and the zoom level appropriate for our data. Um, so all of those are there, and we go forth. Uh, I wanted to put, show one more thing uh, just to show you what you can do with like these single uh, little additions. Um, Mapbox has a geocoder uh, built in, so and that's all uh, coming from their Mapbox places, which I believe is uh, rendered from OSM places, uh, but that might not be true at all. Actually, I don't think that is true because I got some head shakes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're gonna add geocoder. With that one more, we're adding control geocoder, and it pops up right there. Now we have an entire map with, with points. We can go to Oakland, show it there, and center our map on Oakland. Or we can go to Cape Town and go to Cape Town. Um, so a lot of little powerful things, actually really powerful things, available in now what we have as like six lines of JavaScript. Um, so that concludes the live coding session. <laughs> Uh, of our presentation. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Patrick here. Cool. cool. So what if we wanna do with some, some like more in-depth visualizations? Um, so CardDB is another a tool that's uh, really easy to use for this kind of stuff. And it's really also good for, as an exploratory tool. So if you wanna see what your like breaks in your data, if you wanna see what it looks like in the map, if you wanna see quickly if you styled it this way versus this way, you can do that in a, in a few minutes on CardioDB. Um, so if you want to upload school locations from ArcGIS server into CardioDB, we're going to walk through some visualizations. That's at bit.ly slash summit school data. I'll just go there now. And this again is on uh, opendata.arcgis.com once it loads. So another way you can interact with this data uh, rather than having to download it and make a GeoJSON and all that kind of stuff um, you can actually link directly to it. Um, so there is an API that ArcGIS puts out that's really great to interact with. Um, and it's right here on the source. So if you go down here, you right click and copy link address as, 
you can go to CardiDB. So CardiDB, you need a sign for account. I would, if you're following along, I don't see any laptops really out furiously doing things. So sign up for account, and you can access. Um, you can go to new data set, and there's all kinds of things here that you can connect. If you go all the way over, there's one called ArcGIS Server. So if you if you sign in and you see ArcGIS Server and you click it, it's going to say you can ask for a demo. They're pretty nice. If you ask for a demo, they'll probably give it to you. Um, they gave it to me in like a couple of days. Um, and then you can just enter the URL here and hit submit. And it gives you options how to sync your data. So you can either sync it never, every hour, every day, every week, every month. This is school data, so, um, so I, it's probably not going to change every day. So I can just say every month or never. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because that's going to take forever. But um, we already got that set up. So. All right, so here's the actual data. You can see I have it set up to sync in a month. So it's set up to sync yesterday. Um, it's going to sync in a month. I can sync it now if I want to. Um, and here's the actual data. It's got um, a bunch of different fields. And if you go to map view, here's all the, uh, here's all the schools. Um, what's cool is it's got all these wizards built in. So without really having to know too much about cartography or GIS or any of that kind of stuff, um, you can try out a bunch of different symbolization methods using their wizard. So uh, first off is clusters, so you can get basic clusters that are dynamic so the clusters change as you zoom in. Um, that's great if data is really close to each other, you can see kind of everything at the same time or at least get a count. Um, there's also, there's nothing super quantitative here, so, but there is Coreplath if you wanted to do something like um, if there was a uh, attendance information or something like that, you could do that. Um, categories about in this data set is probably one of the most interesting ones just because it has things broken out into this legend right here. Um, ah. You can see here it's like broken out into different types. So there's ninth grade to 12th, uh, ASAM, I don't know what that stands for. Um, there's adult education, elementary school, high school, K through 12, K through 6, et cetera, et cetera. But, if you're looking at the entire Oakland area, you can kind of get a sense of where all these kind of schools are and, and kind of the patterns of that. Um, I'm not going to go super in depth into this data. It's if, you, if you dig into it for a while, you can do some pretty cool things. Like, uh, actually, that's a Curtis CSS. So if you wanted to combine some of these categories together, you could do that pretty easily just by, by copying this and doing an end statement. Um, there's a lot of tutorials online about Curtis CSS. I encourage you to go check that out if you want to customize some of this stuff. Um, but it's a pretty powerful tool for just, for, for this kind of work. Um, you can also <coughs> share it pretty easily. So if I, I hit visual, visualize, hit OK, create map, um, then I can publish it, I can embed it, I can link someone to it, and I can actually call it in CardiDBJS, which is another J JavaScript library. Um, so in a few seconds, I just did that. And that's what's great about connecting it directly to something like, like an API, like ArcGIS's API, is that it gets updates all the time. So you don't have to like, be checking on it all the time. Um, there's all kinds of ways to plug and play data and different tools right now. It's been an exciting few years. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but um, if you go back to the education, um, you know, on the map there, or Park TV, mm -hmm. uh, can you show this. only, like, say there's, you know, the, the schools, you know, like, only show a certain amount of high schools, a certain amount of middle schools, and a certain, over a certain number? You know, yeah, so you can do. That yeah, so it has a, a SQL editor in there as well. So it, this CardiDB is all built on Postgres SQL, so you can do. Um, basic SQL statements, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can, court yeah. And there's also other ways to do it too. You can go through. Um, you can filter by different columns. So if you do that, you can search this column. Let's say my site. Okay, so let's say Christian. I just want to get Christian schools. See if that actually does something. Yeah. See it and it filtered it according to. Schools that have Christian in the title. Correct. Yeah, you can do that. You can either do it in Carta CSS or you can filter it, or just much different ways. You can put about four or five different layers in the same map together. Yeah. I think it was all hex values. It's all hex values, but you know you can go to Color Brewer and get the those values. I think you do RGB too, right? Yeah, if it's all across the set. Right. Cool. Yeah, no problem. 
yeah, if anyone has any questions, let us know as we're going. It's like, totally fine. Don't don't let the stage for you. There's no hierarchy here. <laughs> um, cool. So geocoding. Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, what is geocoding? <laughs> what is geocoding? So there's a lot of different ways to geocode data. Um, there's ArcGIS Online, there's Batch Geo. You can do it on CardDB directly. Um, so geocoding is basically just taking a bunch. If you have like a list of addresses, um, basically what that does is it matches it up against a bunch of different coordinates and gives you those coordinates. So it's just basically a matching service. Um, so um, we have a gist of where is that? I'm missing this. Right there. Where is it? Yeah. Okay, cool. 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 Okay, so we have a gist that has a bunch of CSVs here. That's not going to work. And <coughs> how do I just download it? Can I just download zip? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll play this more. Once it unpacks, I can actually get the CSV. This actually ends up yet. <laughs> We have uh, no idea how to use PCs. <laughs> yeah, this is bringing me back. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of different ways to, ge to geocode. I'm going to just do it in CardiDB because it's fairly easy to do. Zero. It says zero. I have to unzip it first, I think. Arg. Did that do it? I think this will actually work. My theory is it'll work. Yay. Okay. So you can hit georeference. Ugh. Okay, I'm not gonna upgrade right now. Anyway. <laughs> Oy, striking out on these live demos. Okay, so you can do that pretty easily. Uh, if you have, do you get a free certain amount of uh, georeferencing credits? I've already burned through them um, this month, and I'm not going to plug in my credit card information um, as a live demo. That's not really fun for anybody. Uh, but anyway, once you do that, you can get those you get those xy point uh, values. It's not like it's it's a pretty easy process. Um, but you can do that in CardiB. You can do that in uh, Ezri, I'm not signed in, and I don't want to go through the signing process of signing into ArcGIS Online, but that's another way to do it. Um, and I will hand it off to Sam to talk about uh, Mapbox Studio. Cool. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to bring it back to the beginning uh, and get back to the tile world, or at least the tile and future of tile world. Uh, so. Um, if anyone's interested in making their own tiles, a few really cool pieces of software have come out over the past few years um, that have allowed you to add data and then render um, uh, just an enormous number of images and uh, host them on uh, uh, Mapbox's servers. 
Uh, and I'm, so I'm going to go through, I, I, I was given access to their new beta version of Mapbox Studio, uh, which is basically a GL renderer uh, for map tiles. Um, I guess they're not tiles anymore at this point. Uh, everything becomes vector-based data. Uh, if you're using GL, you no longer even are rendering images. Everything is rendering uh, vectored and quickly on the fly. Uh, so they've, they've gone through a whole series of changes recently uh, to from image tiles, which rendering which were rendering with uh, MapNet, or excuse me, yeah, which were rendering uh, MB tiles, and then started uh, creating vector tiles, uh, which essentially were taking vector information and rendering uh, images quickly in the browser, and now they're using GL, which is just rendering vector all the way through. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, just a quick like play with Mapbox Studio, um, just because I think it's really cool. And it's a cool little look into what the future of um, scalable, quick web mapping uh, looks like. Uh. Uh, so I'm super into some old maps, uh, including Ptolemy's Map of the World. Uh, I don't know if that's the proper pronunciation of Ptolemy. Um, so I was making a map that uh, looks like the, that takes colors from his old 1498 map. Uh, and so went into Studio and used one of their templates uh, that essentially gives me all these different uh, styling layers um, that are for the current demo, not important to read uh, specifically. Um, but what I can do here is essentially zoom into the world. Let me zoom. Just use this. Zoom into Null Island. Uh, we'll go check out Cote d'Ivoire. Or Ghana. Um, and actually make like in some incredibly fast changes on rendering like this entire base map. Uh, so if I wanted to um, change water which I would have to find here, uh, to black. Uh, I can just give it a hex code. Uh, it also takes RGB. Um, just say zero, and like instantly everything is uh, going to black. Uh, if I wanted to enable zooming by level, uh, whereas like say water is black on a global scale and blue at the uh, local scale, um, I can say at zoom level zero, uh, which is where one tile exists, not zoom level one. Uh, <laughs> I realized my mistake that I said earlier. Uh, um, and then I, I want to say on zoom level, t by zoom level 10, uh, the water should be, uh, we'll say yellow. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, we'll just do red. Uh, that's crazy. That's also a little <laughs> sad. Um, so. As a zoom out, it not only just switches at zoom levels because they're theoretically gone now because there's no like step by step zoom. It's all smooth. Um, so at zero, it's black. But as I as I go between, you can see the color fades to the future state. Um, so like that's all happening in my browser, and that's all available to be. Or it's all happening in my browser. It's all available to any modern browsers that can render GL, so I think that's IE9 plus. Anyone correct me if I'm wrong? Sorry? Yes, this is, yeah, this is Mapbox Studio. This, this is still in beta, so I don't think they've released it publicly yet. Um, sorry? Yeah, so it's running SVG everything. Uh, so if you are wanting to like build a texture and add it as a background, you'd have to build an SVG texture and load it in, and it would, uh, like I guess patternize it across uh, any polygon. Um, so that's just I'm just I'm gonna end the demo there because there's a multitude of things you can do in here. Um, but this is where maps or at least base maps are going. Um, so everything that you le learned about tiles at the beginning that I was talking about is basically obsolete at this point. <laughs> um, but I think the understanding of tiles is incredibly important to the understanding of web maps themselves. Um, so I would be sad if uh, no one, no one knew about their history. Um, so, yep. Mm -hmm.
Um, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. Um, I'm also going to quickly let us conclude our talk and then we can go into a full question if you don't mind. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back to uh, Patrick here to, to uh, bring us home. Sweet. So, so many tools. There's so many, so many ways to map things now. Um, so how do you choose the right one? Um, so first, like, what are you making a map for? Are you making a map to explore data? Are you making a map to present data? Are you trying to build something to interact with for you know your website? Are you trying to build something as the, the base map for an application? There's all kinds of tools for that, and you, just picking and choosing is important. Um, the main thing is just don't force them to do something else. Don't try it like at this point in in mapping. There's no reason to just use one tool. You can use a bunch of different stuff together. So a lot of examples. Just because they're separate doesn't mean they can't be friends, right? We like we like friends, um, and so we're going to show you some examples of tools that work really well together. Um, so you can use Mapillary, which is like a crowdsourced um, street level view um, data source, and you can actually use that in ArcGIS. That's really exciting. Um, this is last year. Um, Esri adopted the Mapbox tile vector spec in a really really momentous pull request. Um, uh, Mapbox also supports uh, Esri file geo databases, so there's not like format wars as much as there once was. You can you can take data from some place and plug it in another place, like we like that example we showed earlier. Um, Cardi JS also plays pretty well with leaflets. So if you want some of the power of those visualization tools, but you want to use a different mapping library, you can do that. So if you want your interactions to be one thing that you know leaflet does, you can load in different visualization from Cardi B. Um, maps and vector tiles and Esri Dojo actually work well together. Um, and CardiB has a lot of integrations, stuff you already use. So like um, Dropbox or Google Drive or Twitter or Mailchimp or Instagram. You could load your Instagram photos pretty easy just by signing in. Um, the other thing is mappers really like to help each other. So um, how many people have heard about, about map time? Sweet. So uh, both of us are map time organizers as well. Uh, if you notice, like a lot of the early stuff sounded pretty much like a map time thing. That's because it was, and we just forked it and made it in something else. Um, thank you to Lizzie Diamond and et cetera for everyone making that. Um, but there's also OSM meetups, um, Code for America brigades. Uh, a lot of them do really cool mapping projects, um, and typically, you can learn a lot just by going to those kind of spaces. And most mappers will gladly help out. And uh, thanks. Um, so we can go back to questions now, and I also highly suggest if anyone has better answers to questions in this room, they should feel free to chime in because, uh, yeah, we're we are just up here to show tools, but I imagine all of you are pretty heavy mappers as well. Um, so, shoot. I believe you can. Uh, does anyone have a better <laughs> answer than uh, I do? Lizzie? Okay. Yes, you can. Um, and also, and I know, uh, yeah, so Lizzie, uh, who works for Mapbox, is here and she can give you quite a bit more information, I imagine. Um, there's also one, uh, uh, one library that we didn't talk about called D3, which is a JavaScript visualization library. Um, and they do everything SVG based and uh, they don't. They don't use tiles, but you can. There's an incredible map projections uh, plugin for D3 uh, that is really impressive as a cartographer. So. I know. I know you asked a question in the right before it concluded. Could you ask it again, and then we'll uh, get to you. So I meant actually got everything wrong. <laughs> but, uh, I'm pretty new, That's and I'm actually new beyond the GIS, so okay. uh, it might be really. Ridiculous question, so sorry about that. There's no ridiculous question. Uh, uh, you said uh, everything is now is rendered on the client side, uh, let's say on the browser, if uh, they are mm -hmm. using on the browser. Um, let's say just for the United States counties, um, when we had the shape files and I had the opportunity to change those shape files and import them in the database mm -hmm. and then write the application to get all of those and create the shapes on the client side. Uh, with all those uh, improvements that I did, I could actually decrease the size of my JavaScript to something like 12 megabytes, which wasn't actually really clear. 
because I removed lots of points and uh, right. changed it to make it small. So when you said everything is handled on the client side, what do you mean exactly? All those information coming on the client side and gets mm. rendered when you increase the, uh, the zoom level yep. uh, because all those uh, shape files. So that's, yeah. my so that's actually a, that's a big thing that comes up with me all the time when I'm doing what is it, like if you loaded all of your shapefiles as GeoJSON onto a web map and you said you had like 100 megabytes of, of shapefiles yeah, and 12 right. megabytes of GeoJSON or whatever they might be, that'd be a lot. And like that won't work for like a standard user experience. Um, so what you would do before, like pretend I didn't show you the Mapbox Studio stuff, what you would do is maybe render those as their own uh, like raster layer that you could load on top and uh, giving handle click events for those spaces. Um, but I believe, I, I don't know GL at all, so I'm not a GL person here, uh, but I believe GL is just like, allows you to render SVG like much faster. Um, so that would be, Andrew, had a, Andrew raised his hand back here too. Was that a question or were you? Yeah, please, please do. <laughs> you both have to speak in unison there to answer his question. <laughs> so well, I'd, I'd say it's vector tiles actually follow the same spec, the same URL spec. So what you said before with PNGs still applies mm, with vector yeah. data. So they're still tiled, which is nice. So you're only getting those. At the different zoom levels, you're getting different um, uh, precision of those geometries. So when you're getting like US counties and you're all the way zoomed out, when it gets mm. that, it might only be like five points because they'll have that zoom level zero. Now the nice thing with vector tiles is you don't have to have all, usually a map, when you play with a web map, probably has like 20 zoom levels. You can get by with vector tiles with like five or six. Because as you cut through, when you cross over like zoom level seven, it'll say, okay, give you now the higher precision um, counties, and, but only the ones you're looking at. So that might only be another 200 kilobytes. And then when you zoom all the way into like California, you might say, okay, you're getting the full resolution counties, but you're only getting like 10 counties, so it's still only at 100 kilobytes. So Till takes advantage of the geographic um, of the tiles in terms of the area you're looking at, as well as the zoom level for precision. So it's still fairly small. Yeah, and the, the like key operative part of that is that when you add geographic data um, to use in like G with GL, you um, are converting it to a vector tile format. So it's no longer a shapefile, it's no longer GeoJSON. It's a vector tile format that's much more compact. Um, and because there, you don't have to render images at individual zoom levels, like Andrew was saying, um, it, uh, you don't have to have individual data sets at each zoom level, You can because you can render on the fly, so it can render in infinite zoom levels, and it only needs to get more detailed every few zooms, as opposed to um, at every zoom. Thanks, guys. I believe we have time for one more question. You didn't stand up, yeah. Ah, so do I. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. So, how would you recommend uh, like geocoding uh, HIPAA data? Is that a none of the HIPAA data that I work with is geographic? So, <laughs> oh, got it. Got it. Yeah, we work with a public health agency. Um, so, is I mean, do do you recommend just getting like an ArcGIS uh, uh, database for geocoding just on on your server? Yeah. Um, and there's there's obviously it's it's going to be very hard to do it. Sure. Are you, are you trying to display it like in a public setting, or is it for your own uses? Um, internal. Oh, internal okay. uses, yeah. yeah. Um, also, I mean, it's going to be de-identified at that level, so yeah. um, you know, we might do a heat map. Um, so, so it'd be, it'd be great to also maybe publicly display it. Okay. Um, I mean, there are ways to make, to do private um, versions of all that data. Mm -hmm. So, I, right. I'm not, I'm not sure. Is, does ArcGIS Online allow privacy? Like, you can do private. Yeah, it, it does. All, all those platforms allow you to do private. Right. Right. Are they HIPAA right. compliant? Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. Right. Uh -huh. Right. Yep. <laughs> oh my God. They're so. Oh great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Everything goes nice. Perfect. <laughs> great, great, great. Uh -huh. Right. 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 
actually prevent the data from being shared. And, right. and I've seen some really bad right. cases where someone said, right. but look, we just had a heat map, but you look at the JSON and there's uh -huh. everyone's name uh -huh. and uh -huh. address and everything. So <laughs> yeah. no. be that's really rough. careful. Just because you can't rough. see it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. I feel your HIPAA pain. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's fun. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good afternoon.